You know, just after this last message, I was, I was out in the back talking to a lot of parents and even adults that are going through a lot of crazy stuff with their, with their kids. And uh, we live in a crazy world, you know. I mean, look at the social media. We all share the social media. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, South Africa, Asia. I was just in Australia a couple days, or two weeks ago I was on Australia. And then I was in Colorado, which was uh, Boulder, which is the second most liberal city in the United States. And uh, as you cruise through all these different areas, even the churched areas, you realize that we're all connected on our devices and we're all looking at the same stuff, or we are all can be exposed to the same stuff. And we know that a device can either edify your soul or curse your soul. There's no in-between. It's either going to lift you up or it's going to destroy you by the stuff that you're watching. Jesus says the eye is a light to the body. And whatever goes in goes into the heart. And that's what comes out of the heart is whatever's going in through the ears, the eyes, and what you're putting in. So the good news is, is that Jesus Christ is moving. That's awesome. We're traveling around. We're seeing a lot of kids get saved. Um, last time I was here, nine months ago, I was doing a tour called Wake Up Tour. And it came from John 435. It says, Jesus said, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Since the last time I was here, we toured the public high school system. And I'm going to show you guys some photos right now of a highlight reel of this last year. We went to 59 public schools around the nation and outside of the United States, <laughs> Mexico, Toronto, the States. We've seen 19,000 students show up, and we've seen 15,000 students come forward and give their life to Jesus Christ. God is moving. It's like the book of Acts, revival and riot. We were at a middle school, and we couldn't get enough kids into the gymnasium, so they had to shut the door. So they had to call the principal and the teachers to block the door because there wasn't enough room, and then a riot broke out, and they started throwing their sandwiches and lunches. And then everyone inside got saved. It was amazing. Just like a book of Acts. We're living it. Then we went to the school in Tustin High School. They had 20 kids in their Christian club that they would meet at lunch. And they invited us. And I said, get the gymnasium. We ended up having 350 kids show up. 250 of those kids came forward and gave their life to God. Now, now the Bible club is 200 strong every week. They had to move out of their classroom into the gymnasium. We, as Christians, walk by faith. We, don't, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith. And we never look back because we're not going backwards. We're moving forward. When Paul talks about the breastplate and the helmet and the shield, he never talks about protection on the back because we're not going backwards. We're moving forward like the 300 in that movie, the 300. Or William Wallace, we put our war paint on and we're taking the land. In Jesus' name, the scriptures say the Lord is a warrior and Yahweh is his name. It also says that God is a consuming fire. We need him to consume every part of our life so we can be full and empowered with the Holy Spirit. So we can live that destiny and that purpose that we were created for. So we walk by faith, not by sight. James 1, verses 2 to 4. I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to read a few things to kind of build up um, for this moment that I'm going to talk about in John 12, 12. We're going to talk about a day in life with Jesus, but I need to kind of build the story because of the issues and the things that we're going to be talking about today. So just go along with me and listen, and then we'll turn to John 12, 12 and, and read some scriptures from there together. James 1, verses 2 to 4. It's about faith and endurance. And this is for women and men, as James writes. Dear brothers and sisters. So he's speaking to everyone in the room. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I hate that verse. When troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I know you don't like that one either. But then as we keep reading... And we don't take it out of context. It says this, the next verse. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. In 10 years of me being a Christian, I've experienced many types of storms. I'm meeting with people that are going through storms or my own personal storms. My life, I'm either going into a storm I'm actually currently in the middle of a storm right now. 
I'm, going, I'm in the middle of a storm or I'm coming out of a storm. I see a storm behind me or I see a storm brewing in front of me. My life has been very stormy. If they were to name me after a garbage pail kid, my name would be called Stormy Normie. <laughs> but what I've come to realize is that not all storms have come to disrupt our life. Some have come to clear our path. Not all storms have come to disrupt our life. Some have come to clear our path. My message is called God's Signs in the Storms. Ten years ago, I gave my life to Jesus Christ in a hotel room. I was managing a professional skateboard team and working in the music industry. Currently, I'm still working in the music industry as well and reaching out to the skateboard community, UFC community, all like the action sports and art communities. But I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I was going after the lust of the eye, the pride of the life, and the lust of the flesh. It says that these are not from the Father. And this is what the wor what, being, what worldly means is going after these things. It's not what you look like or what you wear. It's going after these things. If these things are manifesting in your life, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, these are the things of the world. And basically, I went after those things. I made success, but I was empty. And I had lost 16 friends to suicide and drug overdose. I lost one of my friends um, a couple weeks ago or maybe a month ago now, Tyler Evans. He's the one that helped pioneer the whole freestyle motocross industry and sport, and he just uh, committed suicide. It's in the news. But a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, great things happening, a lot of success and good times. Um, sinning's fun, but then what happens is sin gets a grip on you, and it got a grip on me, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ in a hotel room. I OD'd from ten, uh, ten day, nine days of Xanax, alcohol, and uh, cocaine, and I said, Jesus, if you're real and you are the Son of God, prove that you're real to me. Because my dad's a pastor. I was jaded by religion. I want nothing to do with church or church people. And I said, if you're real, Jesus, prove that you're real to me and I'll follow, follow you. And I said, Jesus, forgive me for my sins and come into my life. Well, I thought Jesus Christ was going to show up in his clouds of glory with his angels, rainbows, and lightning bolts. Be like, my son, Ryan, I've been waiting. I don't know if he talks like that, but he never showed up. Jesus Christ was a no-show, so I jacked the Bible or stole the Bible from a hotel. And I got on a plane, I read it for six hours straight, I landed peace, and I was in the storm of my life, and I went home, woke up the next morning, I heard this song singing through my head, this is the day the Lord has made. I heard this small, still voice, God spoke to me in a storm, a sign in a storm. So I knew that God was real, and I started reading the Bible, and that led me to go to the Holy Land, to Israel, and I did the whole tour, and I ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I was in a storm in my life because I was like, Jesus Christ, what are you going to do with my life? I work in the music industry. Someone, this is me actually praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Someone sent this to me a couple years ago. I was in a storm. I was broken. I was messed up. I did not know what God wanted to do in my life. But I knew that God was real. But I didn't know what would he do with me. I work in the music industry. I work in the skateboard industry. I do music festivals. How would I fit into this whole Jesus thing? And I remember the prayer, that, the, the message that was given by Pancho Juarez. And he was talking about the story about Jesus being at the crossroads. And he, all he had was the, the cross on his eyes, on, on the focus. And he prayed to Father God. He said, Father God, if you could take the sins away without me going to the cross and dying that gruesome death, please take the sins away. But not my will, thy will be done. And I knew at that point, and pa Pancho also said this, you've all come from L.A. and you have this baggage Today's the day you're either going to leave your baggage here at the cross and deny self, not your will, but thy will be done, or you're going to take all that baggage, and it's a lot of it. He didn't say that, but I can tell you this. The baggage you guys brought in today, it's a lot because the enemy likes to put a lot of baggage on us. He says, or you can leave it here at the cross today or take it back home with you. So I went out, and I sat there in the Garden of Gethsemane, that photo right there. And I said, Jesus, whatever you want to do with my life, if you want me to tell my story and follow you, whatever that looks like in ministry of some format, I don't want to be a pastor like my dad. I said, if you want me to tell my story, have someone contact me that's not in my inner circle so I know it's you. I need a sign in the storm. 
So that day in, that next day in Israel, I got a phone call from a pastor in Las Vegas, Derek Nider, and he heard through friends of friends that I gave my life to Jesus, and he invited me. He said, hey, I heard, he called me, said, I heard you gave your life to the Lord. I want you to come tell your testimony at my church. I was like, Jesus, I was just joking. I didn't know you were going to answer this prayer. Maybe I was emotional in the garden. No, I wasn't emotional. I was real. I was getting real with God. A sign in the storm. I said, all right, I'm going to follow you. I went to Vegas, told my story. That was the birth of the whosoever's movement. We are a movement of whosoever's, the anybody's from presidents to bums. A uh, movement of whosoever's leading the way to reflect Christ in culture. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a whosoever. Whosoever believeth. So basically what happened from here, the movement started. All these rad things were happening. Still storms. This is just a highlight reel of my life. A lot of crazy stuff was going on. But then I found myself in a place, maybe like some of you guys, where you were single and ready to mingle, but there was no one to mingle with. And it gets, let's just be real for a second. It gets lonely sometimes. You know, you're going through life. I'm 32 years old. I feel like God's doing rad things in my life. He's saved my life. He's transformed my life. But now here I am single. And I'm like, man, I've always had a girlfriend in my life. You know, and I was like, God, you know, I'd love to meet the girl of my dreams one day. And I would pray for five years. God never answered any prayers in five years. God, where's she at? Where's she at? God was doing a work in my life, though. I wasn't ready for her. And what happens is finally, after five years, I'm like, Jesus, do you have the girl of my dreams? Just tell me like a yes. I just need to speak to me. I'm not hearing anything. Speak to me and I won't bug you anymore. And I heard him say yes. Just a small, still voice, a sign in the storm. Yes, I said, all right, Jesus, I'm not going to bug you anymore. But I kept bugging him. Where's she at? Where's she at? Fast forwarding, I end up meeting her. And you guys know the story, how that all went down. I meet her. Well, right when I meet her, next you know, a division breaks out. A storm breaks out. A storm breaks out where people that are around me don't like her. Christians in the church, girls that liked me, and I said, I'm not saying that, I'm just telling you guys what happened. These things happen in ministry, right? You guys know that serving ministry. So I get this girlfriend that God brings to me. Then next you know, these other Christian girls that have been very rooted and grounded and in church for a very long time come against the girl that I just led to the Lord two weeks ago. Spitting poison, poison, rumors, gossip. James says the tongue will edify, lift up, or the tongue will destroy, spits venom. Deadly poison. And now this place, they're spitting poison on my wife. My wife's like, I don't like Christians that much. She was a Catholic girl. And then that received the Holy Spirit and then everything transformed. She was like, wow, everyone needs to know about this. This is surreal. But she, her first impressions with Christians weren't that great. And then that division spread through the Bible study I was doing. And I said, listen, we're going to serve the Lord. Any division makers in the church, anyone that's with this crew of people, you and all your friends, get up and get out of here. We don't want you here. We're going to serve God. We're not going to deal with this stuff. And they left. And God kept pouring out his spirit. And people were getting saved like crazy. The Bible talks about that. Don't, don't waste your time with that stuff. You make the clean break. But then that division had a ripple effect, and then it went into my parents and my other family members because some other stuff that was going on. Now there's division in there. Then that division goes into the whosoever's team, and it spreads. And all this crazy stuff's going on, and I'm going, God, you brought this girl. I know this is the one. Why is my world falling apart? I feel like the Bible studies messed up. The, the, we lost the worship team. The, the, the whosoever, it's just all the stuff's going on. And I remember I would go and listen to Chuck Smith every two to three hours a day on a Bible study. And I'd walk through Laguna Hills where I live in that area. And I would walk there and I would go to this cave every day and I would pray to God. But this particular time, I was like Elijah. I was very scared, nervous. I didn't know what the heck was going to go on. And I was like, God, I need you to show up in my life. And I just prayed this prayer. I said, God, is this person leaving? And he said, yes. Well, I said, well, since you're talking, is this other person leaving? He said, yes. God signs in the storms. Later on, I got a, a vision. We you hear about visions in the Old Testament. The prophets would get them. Or in the New Testament, Paul or Peter would get these visions. They're a gift of the Holy Spirit. Some of you guys might get them or a picture or a vision. <clears throat> I got a vision from a girl. And the vision was emailed to me. And it was a, it was a tool shed. And on it, it said, whosoever's forever. 
And in the vision, I guess me and my wife are sitting there and Jesus walks up to the tool shed and he po- starts pulling out an old hammer that was corroded and rusted and broke down. Pulled it out and started getting other tools that were old, rusted and pulling them out. And I guess in the vision, I was going, God, why are you taking these tools away? I need them for the movement. And then God started replacing him with the heavy duty hammer that will never rust and never break. And he started replacing the team, the new instruments for the movement and the vision. Well, guess what? Shortly after that, on the money, those people stepped down and God replaced the team with brand new people. Then that's when the whole new vision and the new ideas came together with us starting the high school tours and middle school tours. So God was getting the old wineskins and removing them because he can't put new wine into old wineskins or else they'll burst. So God was removing the old crew and bringing a whole new crew, bringing new wineskin, new ideas, new move of the Holy Spirit. We started going to the high schools and revival started breaking out because not all storms have come to disrupt our life. Some have come to clear our path. I've learned that Jesus wants to come in and clean house sometimes. And he also wants to show the characters and the people that you're dealing with. So you don't run into bigger storms later on in life. That's just personal lessons that I've learned that you guys could take that into your life. So this is the next thing I'm going to read. Mark 16 says this. Oh, really quick. But what is Jesus? Oh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what does Jesus Christ say about signs and wonders? Mark 16 says this. It's about the Great Commission. He says, later Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples and he sat at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of hearts because they did not believe those who had seen him raised from the dead. They didn't believe in the signs and wonders. They didn't believe in the resurrection, the miracle. These guys were with Jesus for three years and they did not believe that he could be raised from the dead. Talking about hard hearts and stubborn mules, right? Sheesh. Then remember this, faith and unbelief cannot coexist. They're mutually exclusive. You have to have one or the other. Verse 15, he said to him, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every living creatures. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow, and I underline will. They will follow those who believe in my name. They will, and I underline that, they will cast out demons. We just cast out a demon of a girl, 19 years old, that was suicidal at my dad's church about about a month ago before I went to Australia, dealing with suicide. She was completely deceived that she was going to be rich. She was communicating with this demon, talking to him, and she wasn't manifesting like exorcists, like rah, rah, rah. Demons do that sometimes, but sometimes they just talk in a normal language. And basically, this, this girl was from around here. She was completely deceived that this, that this demon was going to make her rich. And after, it was, I don't name demons like the demon of deception or anything like that. The devil wants to deceive, lie, and all these other things. But this particular demon had a stronghold in her life that deceived her that he was going to make her rich through prostitution. And she was 19 years old. It took, took word of knowledge. It took prophecy. God was manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit when we were in that room for three hours with her, reading her scripture. It was a process to finally, when she came to full clarity, and we cast the demon out of her. You will cast out demons, it says. They will speak in, you will speak in tongues. They will take up serpents and if they drink anything daily, it by no means will hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up to heaven and they sat down at the right hand of God and they went out, preached everywhere. The Lord was working with them and confirming the word of God through the accompany signs. They, what did the disciples do? This is lessons for us. They obeyed God and they preached the word of God. And sometimes the only sermon that anyone's ever going to see is your life. So it's about our life, and sometimes when we could use words, we can do that too. The word of God was confirmed, signs and wonders followed. Looking at Jesus' public ministry, he was born of a virgin, which was a miracle. He obeyed God to the point when he was going to get baptized. 
he went to John the Baptist and he said, hey, baptize me. And John's like, dude, I can't even like reach down and untie your sandals. I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, this is what God requires, the obedience and the submission. So John said, all right. And he baptized him. Then it says that Jesus, the sky split, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and filled Jesus. It led him by the Holy Spirit. And in the gospel market says it driven him by the Spirit to the wilderness where he fasted ferociously and prayed for 40 days and prayed hard. Then he made disciples. He, and then he fought, before that, he actually fought off Satan with the word of God. Remember, he got tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He got tempted with the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. And what did he do? He fought off Satan with the word of God. These are the tools that we use, the sword of the Spirit. Because why? Satan always comes knocking at our door. You're good for nothing. You're still struggling with pornography. You're, you're struggling with your marriage. You're a horrible Christian. You lie. Your past life. You've been divorced. Suicide, depression, anxiety. The devil always comes knocking. But he's a liar. He's a serpent of old. He's the destroyer. Jesus says that Satan has come to kill, deal, kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come to give life abundantly. The word of God is truth. The word of God is the DNA of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the DNA of holiness. So we fight off Satan with the word of God. Then he made disciples. He got ordinary men and did extraordinary things. Blue collar people, right? Thank God for using ordinary men to do extraordinary things. Then he was preaching and teaching from city to city in the temples where which, which were like the, the churches. He we did house ministry. He was in the streets. He was in front of large crowds and one-on-one -on -one ministry, just like that story with Nicodemus at night. What else did he do? He showed God's love, his grace, his mercy, and he was living out the Great Commission. Jesus Christ was unorthodox. He was radical. He even went in at the beginning of his ministry into the temple, and it says in the scriptures that he kicked over all the tables, and he knocked over all the money changers, and he made whips. I don't know where he looked for whips with the animals or whatever. He says he made whips, and he chased all the men and money changers out, all the people and animals. Now, I've been to Israel, and some of you have been there in the old city where they would have had the temple area where they would have sold this stuff. It's probably like four or five times as big as this place. Imagine Jesus just called the disciples. Hey, guys, follow me. Okay, let's go. Where are we going? Right to the temple. Jesus makes whips, chases everyone out. That's, they have the Roman guards and everyone there. They probably think they're going to go to jail. They're like, what did we sign up for? Jesus, who is this guy? Jesus, this is insanity. He is wilding out right now. We didn't sign up for this. We were fishermen. But then if that wasn't enough, after he went through his three-year ministry, at the end, again, he went in and destroyed the temple again, tore it up. Because they were ripping off God's people, and they were keeping the blue-collar, common folks, the poor people, to be able to come at to be able to come in and worship God. They were ripping them off, and Jesus, don't play that. A.W. Tozer says this about Jesus. Jesus Christ was untamable. Jesus did many miraculous signs and wonders. He turned water into wine. He cast out demons. He healed the paraplegic, the blind, the sick, the deaf, the, the man with leprosy, the woman bleeding for 12 years. Remember, no money or doctors can fix her bleeding. She was bleeding for 12 years straight. She was desperate. And I love the way she went after Jesus. And I believe 100% this is the way we have to go after Jesus every day of our life. She was desperate for God. And she says that she chased after Jesus. And Jesus had a whole, people, a whole group of people around him. Because he's healing people. He's doing all kinds of things. Of course, you want to be close to Jesus. She had to plow her way through, crawling, kicking, moving, whatever she had to do to get through to touch Jesus. And when she touched Jesus, healing power went out by faith. She did everything in her power to touch Jesus, and God he touched her life. Then he fed the 5,000 plus the women and children. He walked on water. That's amazing. Silence the storm by speaking to it. Well, he is the God that says that nothing was created except through him, Jesus Christ. He is, of course, God over the elements since he created them. He fulfilled prophecy. He raised Jairus from the dead and Lazarus from the dead. Then he went to the cross and died and raised from the, um, from the dead on the third day. Another miraculous sign proving that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 20 says this. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to these ones recorded in this book. 
but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Warren Wearsby says this, Faith in his miracle should lead to faith in the word of God and to personal faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in his miracle should lead to faith in the word of God and personal faith in Jesus Christ. We don't chase miracles. They just happen. He told us in Matthew 6, Mark 16, go out and preach the gospel and these signs and wonders will follow. And all it does is prove that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that the word of God is real. So now... Let's turn to John chapter 12. I want to just hone in on a couple of verses. It's going to be Jesus Christ in a storm. Just a day in a life with Jesus Christ in a storm. John 12, 12. I'm going to read about 10 verses just to kind of lay out the story where we're at in this particular time. But everything I just read you and told you leads up to this point where Jesus is at in his ministry. Verse 12. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. Of Jerusalem, A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, or in the King James Version, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one that comes in the name of the Lord, hail to the king. He's fulfilling a prophecy in Psalms 118. Then it goes on to say, Jesus found a young donkey and rode it to fulfill the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey. He's fulfilling prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, verse 16. His disciples didn't understand at the, at the time that this was to fulfill the prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened, and they realized that these things had been written about him. Up to the exact date in Daniel 9, you got to be Jesus, you got to be God in order to fulfill prophecy up to the exact date. Verse 17, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That's the reason why so many people went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we could do. Look, everyone has gone after Jesus. Now, these are the religious leaders that have been trying to crucify him ever since he, he started his public ministry. Now, Jesus at the, is at the peak of his fame in his ministry in Jerusalem. And now the religious leaders, the people that don't like him, are like, look, there's nothing we could do. Everyone has gone after him. That is so awesome that everyone is going after Jesus at this point. Verse 20, some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a, Philip, paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. And Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to meet Jesus. Now, these are the verses I want to hone in on. Verse 21, Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. Now the time has come for the Messiah to enter his glory. This is the end of Jesus' public ministry. He's about two, two years and a half deep. And now he's on the way to the cross. He knows that he's going to go get spit on. He knows he's going to get the crown of thorns. He knows he's going to get whipped 39 times in those days. If the prisoner wouldn't confess a crime, they would whip him harder the next time. You know those whip, the cat of nine tails, have lead, bone, and different objects in it. So when it would hit them, it would break bones and ribs. It would wrap around their skin, connect, and then they would rip it off. So you got high impact, and you got ripping, breaking of bones, and shredding of meat. Jesus knows the time has come to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world because Father God sent his son, Jesus Christ, on a rescue mission out of eternity to die for mankind so that you and I, whosoever believeth in him, will not perish but live forever. We will not die. Our spirit will never die. But when we take our last breath, we will, get, we will enter heaven and we will live forever. So he says, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. This is the end of his public ministry. And now he's just heading to the cross. He says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful of harvest and new lives. Here he is, he's given an illustration of how he's going to how he's going to die. Verse 25, those who love their life in this world will lose it, but those who care nothing... For their life in this world will keep it for eternity. 
He's talking about eternity here. And he says it a little bit better, better in Matthew 16. He says, if you want to be my disciple or you want to be his followers, and this is why we're here at church, because we do want to be his disciple and his followers. He says, you got to turn from your selfish ways. you got to pick up your cross and follow me. And what does the man profit if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Uh, is there anything worth more than his soul? So what is he saying? He's saying, if you want to be my disciple or my follower, you got to turn from your body appetites. you got to turn from your body appetites you got to get him and you got to hang him on the cross and you could crucify him. The cross is a beautiful place because of the forgiveness of sins, the grace, the mercy, but it's also a gruesome place where Jesus was murdered. And I just told you how it went down. So we got to deny ourselves. We got to get our body appetites. We got to hang him to the cross and we got to crucify him. Romans 8.13 says, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live after the spirit and do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. That's only in the King James Version. Mortify in the dictionary means to self-inflict pain. We got to get our body appetites, which are which? Which are they? The lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. We know these are not from the Father. We got to get our body ap appetites and we got to hang them on the cross and crucify them. And when you crucify your body appetites, it is painful. Painful, right? When you try to deny yourself, but that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes. So he says, you got to be, if you want to be my disciples, you got to turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. And in Luke, it says daily. And then he says, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you're going to save it for eternity. What's he saying? He's talking about eternity. If you give up, if you try to live this life without Jesus Christ being the Lord of your life, you're going to lose it for eternity. But if you give up your life, you give your life to Jesus Christ on this earth, you're going to save it for eternity. What's he talking about eternity? There's two places. And it's very simple. You get to pick smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> Heaven or hell. The question is easy. And this is what Jesus is saying. But we got to deny self. Then he says this. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? I told you, I just had one of my friends commit suicide last week. This dude was driving a Bentley. Money, not an issue. He gained the world, pioneered the sport, top of his game. People love this guy. Awesome dude. I got to meet with him and talk to him. Awesome dude. But what does it matter if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? There's nothing worth more than your soul. Then he says this, Jesus says this, this is why we got to deny ourselves. we got to kill the noise, we got to destroy all gods, destroy all idols in our life. Then Jesus says this, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me. Where is he going? To the cross, to die. If we're going to follow him, we got to head to the cross to deny self. And then he says this, because my servants must be where I am. Well, where is he going to be? He tells us in chapter 14, the next one. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me. There's more than enough rooms in my father's home. And if it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come get you. So you will always be where I am. Jesus is trying to hang out all of eternity with us. He's getting it dialed in, and when everything's ready, he's going to come scoop us up. When we take our last breath, hopefully that's in like 100 years or something. I'll live to like 143 or something. Just joking. But when that happens, God's going to be there. It's all about eternity. We are eternal beings. We are created with the eternity, eternity in us. That's the whole thing. And to deny self, it sounds brutal, but it's not. When you deny self, that's when the Holy Spirit and God starts showing up, and things start moving and shaking in your life. It gets exciting. And some of you believers that are walking that life, you know it. It's worth it. It's all worth it. Then he says this. Then he goes on to say, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father God will honor anyone who serves me. So that's like the icing on the cake. So Father God's going to honor anyone who serves me. Now he goes from talking, and he flips to a prayer. And these are the last verses I want to hone in on. Now he goes to a prayer. Boom. So he's, he's facing the cross. It's getting serious. And he says, now my soul is deeply troubled. He's praying. What should I pray? What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason why I came. Why did he come? He told us in verse 24. I tell you the truth, or verily, 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 unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death 
will produce many new kernels, a plentiful of harvest of new lives. So he's saying just like a plant, just like a seed of a plant will die, you bury into the ground, you water it, it grows a plant, and then the plant produces fruit or produces a flower, and then the seeds drop, they die, they go into the ground, and then it produces another plant. And then you have a plentiful, a harvest of, of new life, a harvest. Well, in the same way, Jesus is saying, what he, the illustration is, I need to go and die on the cross. Then my, bear, my body needs to get buried into the ground for three days. Then I'm going to get watered with the torrents of living water, which is the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to raise from the dead. Then I'm going to go sit at the right hand of the Father, just like after he rebuked the disciples, he said he was at the right hand of the Father. And then anyone whosoever believeth in him will have everlasting life. Anyone that will believe that he is the Son of God, God will send his Holy Spirit and they will be filled and they will start living that Spirit-led life. In the same way, we must die to self. That Ryan Reese, that troublemaker, <laughs> he needs to be buried. That old man needs to be buried into the ground. I need to go to the cross and crucify the, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, that old man, and bury him into the ground and be raised from the dead to that new spirit of life that Jesus talks about in John 3 when he's talking about Nicodemus. He says, you see, you hear, the, you hear the wind blow, you see it, but do you really see the wind blow when you look outside? No, it's like the Holy Spirit. You don't see the wind blow, you just see the effects of it. And in the same way, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, people see around you like, dude, that dude changed. He's like the same crazy guy, Ryan Reese, but there's like something different about him. He's not like watching porn and, and cheating and drinking and using drugs but like he's the same crazy guy but he's like not and all this crazy stuff so that's what the work of the holy spirit does there's only one of you there'll only ever be one of you created god has a perfect plan an individual that's awesome you're not gonna like change all like this whole lifestyle of stuff just the lust of the eye the part of life all the stuff that's like dragging you down that stuff's changed and god shows you your destiny so in the same way, we got to deny self. So Jesus says this. Jesus says, now my soul is deeply troubled. What should I say or what should I pray? Father, save me from this hour, but this is the very reason why I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Not my will, thy will be done is what he's saying. Jesus is 100% man. He's 100% God. It doesn't matter what storms you are going through. Jesus, his soul is crushed. Imagine having to go die for the sins of the world. You know how hardcore that is? This is unbelievable. He's 100% man. He's 100% God. So any struggles, any storms that you're going through right now or that you've been through or that you're going to go through in your future... Jesus has been there. He's going through the worst of the worst. And I'm going to tell you right now, he knows. He's 100% man, 100% God. He knows what you're going through. So what does he do? His soul is deeply troubled. So what does he do? He's in this storm, so he prays, Father, save me from this hour. The prayer I say all the time, Lord, save me from this. Save me. It's when we're talking to him. Then he reasons, wait a minute. This is part of God's eternal plan and purpose. God is working out his plan and his eternal purpose for my life. He sent me on a rescue mission to die for the sins of the world so anyone, all of the world can believe in me and they can be saved and they can live forever. So God is working out his eternal plan and purpose. He reasons. And then what does he do after he reasons? He submits. And he says, Father, bring glory to your name. Not my will, thy will be done in full submission. Two years ago, we, me and my wife... We went through infertility, and what I didn't tell you last time I was here nine months ago is when we were going through this stuff, we got, we, we got, basically we got pregnant. We couldn't get pregnant for two years. We got pregnant with twins, fraternal twins. We went to the doctors, and, you know, they, they said, look, it's a high-risk pregnancy, so keep coming back every two weeks. We came back two weeks later, one of the eggs putting identical twins, and they said, listen, now, you're, you know, this baby's going to die out. So we prayed. By God's grace, God brought that baby back. So we had three, and they said, this is a very high-risk pregnancy. Your wife needs to be on extreme bed rest. That means you have to lay down, hips up, gravity. Basically, you can't get up and cook food. It's a very high-risk pregnancy. And basically, we come back, and at four months, the doctor says these babies are millimeters from coming out, and that we are going to lose 
all of these kids and there's nothing science doctors or medicine can do to keep these kids alive, but we're going to lose them. And we just kept praying and praying and God woke my mom up in the middle of the night with a vision. And the vision was a stormy sea from Jesus's time. And it was a boat from Jesus's time. When you go to Israel, you'll see like a remake of those boats. And on the front of the boat, there was one baby with brown hair looking out the front, two identical twins in the bottom sleeping. And that boat manifested or transformed into Jesus's hand in the storm. So God gave us a sign in the storm. It was very gnarly place. My wife's life was in danger and these kids' lives were in danger. But God gave us a sign in the storm so we knew that God was in control. Then we got another girl that had a dream that saw my wife with a huge belly in front of a stone wall. Then we got another, received another vision from another girl. And that was three coffins. And in each coffin, there was a rose. And on each coffin, it said death. And in the vision, Jesus walked by and wiped off what said death and wrote life. So we knew that God signs in the storms. Because remember, all of God's signs point back to the fact that the word of God is real and that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's it. That's just how it all works. So we knew that we were in a dark storm, but God was in control. And we kept praying and praying, and it was a very dark place in our life. Very, very dark place. And then the doctor said, we have to take these kids out. They're not eating enough. Baby C's not eating enough. And if we take them out, their lungs aren't developed. So now they're all going to have to get lung surgery. And we're like, can this get any worse? Our soul was so crushed and in trouble. These little babies have to come out premature, and then they're going to have to do open, open them up and fix their lungs. This is crazy, crazy stuff. And we keep praying. And what happens is God ended up keeping those Baby's in to 30, I don't even know how many weeks, a long time basically. And God kept them in and we ended up having healthy triplets with no lung problems, nothing. You guys have probably seen this photo. Now this is, this is the kicker. This story that I said today about my, my, me finding Jesus Christ, God bringing the girl of my dreams me having my kids, this is the story that I'm going around telling the story in the high schools and middle schools and even colleges now. We've seen 23,000 students give their life to the Lord in the last couple years, just in the public school system, because not all storms have come to disrupt our life. Some have come to clear our path. I went through hard times. This is just a highlight reel of my life, people. The gospels that we read, it's a highlight reel. Acts was like 30 years. It's a highlight reel. Do you understand? Things are happening every single day of our life, which I don't doubt. God could do whatever he wants. But not all storms have come to disrupt our life. Some have come to clear our path. Now, in closing, it says this. Jesus says, my soul is deeply troubled. What should I say? What should I pray? Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason why I came. Father, bring glory to your name. He's in deep trouble. He prays, he reasons, and he fully submits and give God the glory. Then boom, verse, the next verse says, then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I've already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard this voice, some thought it was thunder. You know how loud thunder is? Others thought it was an angel who declared it was an angel who spoke from heaven. Then Jesus told them, this voice was for your benefit not from mine, a sign in the storm. Jesus is in a storm, pretty much the biggest storm of his life almost. He's about to go, he's heading to the cross and he prays and God gives him a sign. God speaks to him in the storm. Just the same way God will speak to us in storms. But Jesus says this, because some of you guys, well, he doesn't speak to me when I'm in a storm. Jesus said, seek me and you will find me. Knock and the door will be open. When you look up the word seek, go look it up when you leave here. Seek in the dictionary. It means to be on lookout for, to hunt for, to seek out. Are you, when you're hunting, I've been hunting before. You're like, Rambo. (laughs) Are you rambling for Jesus? Are you looking for Jesus? Jesus, I love you. I'm praying, worship you. Show up in my life. Where you at? Where you at? Seeking, you will find. Knocking, the door will be open. You can't just be like, hey, Jesus, I'd love for you to show up one day. Show up. When's the last time you read your Bible? Huh? You go to church once a month. Seek him and you will find him. I guarantee you that. You know why? Because Jesus said it and he is the Mashiach, the son of God, the king. He's the king. And he loves you. And he'll show up in your life. 
Seek him. Seek him with everything in your heart, your mind, your soul. And I promise you, 100% guarantee Jesus will show up in your life. You got to seek him. What did this voice do? This voice confirmed that Jesus' prayer, Jesus was in a, his soul was crushed. He was in a deep storm. But it confirmed his mission to the cross. Jesus, God gave Jesus a sign in the storm that he was with them as he was going through this because all things work together for good for according to his purpose. God is working out his eternal purpose in Jesus' life at this point. Then it also proves that Jesus was in contact with God the Father so that everyone would believe through the signs and wonders that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that the word of God is real. Because in Mark 16, it says, go out and preach the gospel and these signs and wonders will follow. We need to go out and live the gospel. And in closing, I got one short story that's going to blow your mind right now. This is the ender. Five years ago, I came up with a concept and I designed it all to come up with this. I've always been into like creative stuff. And I said, you know, I would like to create a building project that would be a bridge from the streets to the church. And it would go into low income neighborhoods. And we could put it in a low income neighborhood where kids don't have a computer or kids don't have instruments or beat machines or microphones and they don't know how to play music or they don't know how to start a band or maybe they want to be skaters. We have a skate park there. We have a concert venue. We can do battle of the bands. We can do art shows. We're going to teach kids how to do music and art and find out their purpose because Jesus Christ is the creator and he, we were created to create. That's what we do. And then through all that, we can disciple them, turn them into little John the Baptist and send them out to go tear it up and light the world on fire <laughs> using these gifts. So I came up with this whole idea. And basically what happened is we met with someone and they were going to give us like, it's like a million dollars or something to, to, to do the whole thing. And we were looking at buildings. This is five years ago. And we couldn't find the right building. And we, we, saw, we were on hunt. We were looking for it. We couldn't do it. it the doors didn't open. And it was all good on paper, but it didn't happen. So I walked away, and I was in a storm. I was like, man, God, people aren't, kids aren't coming to church. This would be amazing. And I just walked away, and I said, you're working out your eternal plan and purpose in my life, God. Thy will be done. I'm just going to keep following you. Where are we going? He said, follow you. Where are we going? So I kept following him. He never told me. Still hasn't told me. I'm just going. And uh, what happens is, Five years later, I'm at an autograph signing. Jesus shows up in funny places. I'm at an autograph signing for a secular band that are my friends, and I was showing them my, my wife and my kids. We were all down there hanging out with them. And one of the girls in the band's like, hey, my, my, my uh, cousin's out here on tour. She's a, she's a soul sister from the south, Mississippi or Georgia or something. She got the crazy ebonics going on. And uh, she's awesome. We were talking, you know, her slang's so gnarly. And uh, we're talking, and, you know, for like 15 minutes, and then... Uh, she gets done, and I'm like, okay, well, I got to take my kids to nap time because nap time is my favorite time. And uh, I'm about to leave, and she goes, hold up. She goes, I'm getting a vision. I'm like, oh, no, I never met this girl in my life. She goes, I see a vision. And she says, there's a man that's going to come to you. And this man's going to come to you. I see, he's like, I see he has, like, several properties, but he's going to come to you, and he is going to give you a building. And this man's going to give you a building, and it's a big building. And she's like, oh, it's a massive building. And this building, she says, there's brick all over it. Massive brick building. He's going to give it to you for maybe an idea that you had maybe years ago. But he's going to give it to you for an idea that you had maybe years ago. And she goes, that's all I got. I was like, that's all you got? <laughs> so I left. I told my wife, I'm all, dude, this girl said this. We drive home. 40 days later, I'm speaking at a rehab. I walk in, this guy's like, hey, Ryan, good to see you. He's like, hey, when you're done um, speaking, um, I want to show you a building I just bought. I go, okay. So we, I get done speaking, and after he's like, yeah, he's like, I just bought the, uh, the YMCA building for like $2.6 million, and, uh, you know, I want to show it to you after. So we drive down there, and I'm like, $2.6 million? Who is this guy? This guy's like, it's a lot of money right there. So we go, we go down. And uh, we, we basically pull up, and as we're, as we're walking through, right when I pull up, I see this massive 
brick building. There's nothing but brick on this building and windows. Massive. Well, it turns out this building's 80,000 square feet. Massive brick building. I get out. I'm walking up. And he's like, yeah, man. He's like, I want to do like a skate park over there. And then I want to do like a cafe here. And then we walk into this one room. He's like, I want to do like a concert venue here. He's like, I want to go to the second one. He's like, I want to teach kids how to do music and art and this. I'm like, is this dude in my mind? <laughs> and so at the end, I'm like, so, so this is amazing, man. I love it. In P-Town right there, dude, this is like hotbed for human trafficking and gangs and prostitution and I mean, I, I deal, I, I meet with a lot of the cops. I deal with, I, I meet, I know these things because I did, met with the, D, the DEA of, of LA. They came and met with me a couple months ago. I meet with the Orange County sheriffs. I meet with the LA cops because I work with human trafficking victims. I work in rehabs. I work with gangs. I work with all kinds of people. I know everything that's going on in the cities. They give me the insight so I know what the heck's going on in certain areas of, of neighborhoods, obviously. So this would be a perfect area to go and have a building. So I go, listen, I go, this is amazing. I, I grew up in Laverne. I'm like right there, neighbors. I'm like, this would be amazing to do. I'm like, so what, dude, this is awesome. But like, what do you have me here for? He goes, because God showed me you're the guy to do it. And I'm like, what? So that's the building right there. Go down there and walk around and see if you find anything but brick. You won't. <laughs> so this is the deal. It's in the news. You can look up in the article. Just look up YMCA, got purchased by a new owner, and it's happening. It's being restored and the whole thing. Now, this is the ender. God loves you. God is love. God came on a rescue mission out of eternity to die for the sins of the world. I've given you the gospel, the raw gospel. It's black and white. God is love. He wants to forgive you. He wants to fill you. He wants to remove anxiety. He wants to move, remove depression. He wants to remove suicidal thoughts. He wants to remove addiction, pornography, drugs, alcohol problem, broken marriages. He wants to restore prodigal kids. He wants to bring them home. He wants to use you. Like I said, there's only one of you created and there will only ever be one of you. You have a plan. You have a destiny. You have marching orders, but you'll never know until you turn on the light. And when you're walking through this earth without Jesus Christ, there is no light on. When you are illuminated and filled with the Holy Spirit, that's when the light turns on and that's when you get your marching orders. And Jesus is going to say, follow me. And you're going to go, where are we going? And he's not going to tell you everything because we walk by faith. We walk by not not knowing what's in front of us, but as we take each step, just like G Peter stepped out of the boat and started walking on water, he started living the impossible. Peter would have never known he could live the impossible unless he would have stepped out of the boat and walked by faith. What were the other 11 disciples doing? They were scared. <laughs> they didn't do nothing. They were scared. But Peter, the risk taker, which I love about him, never said the right things, but he was a risk taker. And he stepped out of the boat. And he denied Jesus three times at the end of all that. And guess what Jesus did? He repented and God used that dude powerfully. Blue collar, common folks, just like you and me. Awesome. God loves, he wants to forgive, and he wants to empower you. It